this story as murder, um, rape, and abduction. So if you're not into that for the style of ASMR, I have other videos that are relaxing. There are a ton of other ASMR creators that create super relaxing content that's not true crime. So don't be afraid to click off if you don't want to have anything to do with true crime. So the story, uh, the case I'm going to be talking about today is the case of Molly Bish. She is pretty well known. It's a pretty well known case, but not as big as John Bonet or Madeline McCain. I have my notes right, right to the right of me. So if you see me looking off camera, it's probably because I'm looking at my notes. Okay, so let's get right into it. Molly Bish was born in August of 1993 to John and Maggie Bish. John was a probation, proba probation officer and Maggie was an elementary school teacher. Molly also had two siblings, Heather, her sister, and John Jr., her older brother. When Molly was very young, I think when she was close to being like one or a baby, the family moved from Detroit, Michigan to Warren, Massachusetts. One source I read said they, the reason they moved from Detroit to Warren was because they had it experienced an abduction and murder right in their neighborhood. Warren, Massachusetts is quite a small town and has a rural feel. And today the population is um, only about 5,000, so it's a pretty small town. Growing up in Warren, Massachusetts, Molly was known for being outgoing and popular, as well as um, a couple sources said she was a little bit silly. She was very athletic and played basketball, soccer, and softball in high school. She also had a boyfriend who they went to prom and they hung out a lot. She was also an honor student, so she was just a normal 16-year-old in high school. In the summer of the year 2000, Molly was 16 years old and started as a lifeguard at, I think it's Commons, Commons, Commons Pond. The pond is located just south of the town and from what I looked at on Google Maps, it's like the only body, closed body of water in the area, so probably a place that a lot of people in the town frequent during the summer. So, leading up to her disappearance, uh, at 9 a.m. on June 27th, the year 2000, Molly was heading to work. It was Summer's first day of swim lessons and only her eighth day on the job. I read in another article that it, her brother actually held the position before her for three years, so um, I'm guessing that people, like, they knew the area they knew the job, like they knew how, Molly knew how it went, the mom knew the area, like the family was very familiar, and probably people who frequented the pond were familiar with um, the fishes. So her mom was driving her to drop her off at work, but before they stopped at a local convenience store at around 9.50 to pick up some water, and they're seen um, on surveillance cams at around 9.50. Then they went to the local police station to pick up a required two-way radio for Molly's lifeguard job. There were no telephones or communications in, at Coleman's Pond, and again, this is the year 2000, so they don't have Android or an Apple iPhone. So there were no telephones, and the two-way radio was the only way the lifeguards could contact police in case of emergency or anyone else in the area. Also, I'm so sorry about the creaking. I am in a tiny chair that I've literally had for my entire life. Um, it's the size of a kindergartner's chair, so it is creaking and it is old, but there's nothing I can do about it. So, anyway, back to Molly. Molly's mother dropped her off at work at 10 a.m. and minutes later, the first swimmers of the day arrived for swim lessons. Molly was wearing a blue bathing suit as well as shorts. One of the first parents to arrive at Gomez Pond noticed that Molly was not at her station, but like the lifeguard chair was set up, her shoes 
shoes were there, her lunch was there, um, and the first kid, first aid kit was also there, but it was open, so clearly she had been at work, and she had set up, and she was just missing right when the swimmers got there. Given she was six, but of course no one thought anything of it, she was 16 years old, and it was assumed she had just walked off with her friends and left to go somewhere. Um, so one of the mothers of the kids in swim lessons assumed the position of lifeguard, and then after the lessons informed Molly's boss of the absence, which peeved me a little bit because if I was a mother, I definitely would have told the boss, like, oh, where's the lifeguard? Like, hello, my children's in swim class, I need a lifeguard, but also, like, it's a small town, it's over 20 years ago, who's to say? So, at 11.44 a.m., so two hours, no, an hour, yeah, almost two hours since Molly's been missing, Molly's boss via the two-way radio reported to police that Molly had gone missing. The Warren Police Department really didn't take it seriously and just assumed that the 16-year-old had ditched work and was with her friends. Of course, so when 1 p.m. rolled around, Molly still hadn't returned to her post, so it's been three hours, three hours, three hours. Um, so three hours later, the police notified the parents, who were then informed, who, excuse me, the police notified her parents where they were informed by Maggie, so Molly's mom told the police that her daughter had been dropped off at work earlier that day. If I was the boss, I would have called the parents way earlier, like uh, immediately, if Maggie's not there, especially since the boss probably knows the family from her older brother working there. Like, why wouldn't you contact the family immediately? It was also only her eighth day of work on a new job, so it's really unlikely that she would just ditch, especially she was well-known and an honor student, and from what I can tell, had an okay reputation. But, um, anyway, so, upon hanging, Maggie hung up with the police and then called her daughter, Molly's sister Heather, to inform her of the situation, and Heather agreed with her mother that something was wrong. So they met at the police station where they were told there was nothing to be concerned about. Maggie and Heather set to, set to work looking for Molly. Actually, previously in the day or the day before, Molly's friend had gone into a car accident, so the friend was in the hospital, so they thought maybe Molly was visiting her friend in the hospital out of worry, so they checked the hospital. She wasn't there. They checked Molly's boyfriend's house. He wasn't there. He also wasn't very worried, but he, he was like, she's probably just you know, Bay and Molly. So, they weren't too worried. Molly's, so Molly's boyfriend and Heather drove to the pond to meet with Maggie, where they saw the scene and they realized, okay, she didn't just ditch. So no one told them that the first aid kit was there, the shoes were there, her lunch was there, the lifeguard station was set up. No one had told the parents that. So they saw that and realized, wait, no, she didn't just ditch, like, something happened, she would never just leave all this stuff out and leave the swimmers, so Maggie argued with the police and said all this, and after talking more with the family, the officers actually began to think that something was wrong, and so they called in state police to help, because they didn't have much experience working on a missing persons case. Upon being brought in, the state police wondered if Molly could have drowned in the pond, something her family immediately disagreed with, as she was a strong swimmer and yeah, she was a lifeguard. This theory upset John Jr., her brother, who ran into the water in search for his sister, only to be pulled out by authorities. A dive team and boats were brought in to search the pond, but after several hours, they had found nothing, and the search, along with the one of the woods, was called off until morning. I mean, that makes sense to think she would have drowned, like freak accidents happen all the time, even if you're a super 
strong swimmer, like she could have been going into the water to get something that she saw, and something happened, and she hit her head and drowned. Like freak ac accidents happen like that all the time. Okay, so it is now the next day at 6 a.m. on June 28th. Law enforcement deployed all units, including a helicopter with infrared imaging and a mounted unit. Um, as well, townspeople initiated their own search parties and businesses printed out and posted missing persons flyers at their storefronts. So the word is out. Molly ba Bish, Molly Bish is missing. If I say Molly Bosch, Please excuse me, I had a friend in college whose name was Molly Bosch. So police began to look at a path that led from the beach at Comins Park to a nearby cemetery as they thought it, if someone had been abducted, um, they could have exited the area through this path and not been seen. I forgot to mention also that Comins Park is in a heavily wooded area. Like, I used to live in Connecticut and that, like, the East Coast is just all woods unless the area has been cleared so it's Cummins pond is a man-made pond and then like thick woods everywhere and there was a lot of fishing and hunting in the area so as well since they since they noticed molly's first aid kit was open that um they speculated that someone could have faked an injury to get her to come off the stand and open the first aid kit and get a band-aid or something go give them the band-aid and then she was abducted. Maggie realized uh, that she might have saw or who might have seen who abducted her daughter because she remembered the day before as she was dropping Molly off for work seeing a suspicious looking man at the pond the day before she disappeared. So it's a small town. You know people who live there and uh, you know people who don't. If you see a sketchy looking dude in a parking lot outside of a pond staring at your daughter, yeah, it's going to be in your head. So according to Maggie, the morning started out like any other, but she and Molly arrived at the pond and she noticed a white vehicle parked in the parking lot. While Maggie watched her daughter, she noticed the man in the vehicle was watching Molly as well. So, and he appeared to be glaring at her and Maggie stayed with Molly while she organized and set up her lifeguard station and then the man drove away and Maggie felt comfortable enough to leave and he thought, she, she might have thought he was just another, like, fisherman at the pond. When asked for a description of the man, Maggie described him as approximately 50 years old with salt and pepper hair, dark eyes, a mustache, smoking a cigarette. She worked with the artist to make a composite sketch of the unknown man. When shown the image, John Jr. didn't recognize him as a regular of Coleman's Pond. So right, John Jr. had been a lifeguard there for three years, so he knew the regulars of what fishermen. Uh, and I get that. I was a lifeguard just at a pool. And you get to know, like, the regulars and who's coming. Um, like, who comes at 5 a.m., and who comes on Wednesday, and who comes on Sunday morning, and who comes on Friday John Jr. said he wasn't a regular. So, upon learning about this encounter, police set up a roadblock and asked town, townspeople about the, about the vehicle, where they learned it had been seen at the cemetery near Gomez Pond a few days prior. As well, the district attorney's office ordered a search of 125 white vehicles from the area, but they didn't know the type of vehicle uh, Maggie had seen, so it didn't result in any new leads, and white is a pretty common color. Thousands of tips were called in from across the U.S. regarding the man, but they didn't result in anything, unfortunately. When, the when police had returned to Coleman's Pond, they found the scene had been contaminated by those who had first responded. There were too many new fingerprints and footprints and a ton of used cigarettes, so they were unable to find any concrete evidence. I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate. When that happens, I hear so many cases like that where evidence is destroyed and compromised. It's, it's very frustrating. So police didn't have any evidence to work on, so they had to begin to think of um, what had happened to Molly, uh, ways she could have voluntarily left, as there were no reported sightings from across the country, but her family firmly believed and told police that she would have never left without telling them, especially left her stuff. She left her shoes. She left her sandals. Why would you leave and go barefoot into the woods? Uh, they also thought that she had known her attacker or that she trusts 
arrested her attacker, which made her get off the stand um, and leave her post. Obviously, if you trusted them or if they were a figure of authority, you, it would make you someone like leave their post as a lifeguard. So her boss and her boyfriend were considered persons of interest, but they had an alibi and, and they were also unco uncooperative with the investigation, but they passed a polygraph test. So investigators then looked into area sex offenders and checked alibis. Um, they took polygraphs and they also looked at John Sr.'s old cases because he was a probation officer, but all of those leads led to dead ends. Um, in May 2003, so this is three years later, so everything led to a dead end. They couldn't find anything. They hadn't even found Molly Bish's body. They didn't know if she was alive or dead or what was going on. In 2000, so three years later, an unrelated tip came in saying Molly had been sighted in Miami, Florida. Investigators were prepared to make a trip down to Florida to follow up on it. Until on May 16th, they received a tip from a retired cop who believed the missing girl's disappearance was related to the 1993 abduction and murder of another young girl, Holly Buranen. Um, so that was an abduction and murder seven years prior. So they ignored the Miami thing and they focused on Holly Buranen. So really quickly, just to give a backstory, the reason why they thought they could be connected because um, it was the same area. It was, I think it was Stir, it was Stir Bridge, Massachusetts, which is about 20 minutes south of Warren, Massachusetts, right on the border of Connecticut and Massachusetts. Again, a small town, but only 20 minutes south, so in the area. And because Coman's Pond is also south of Warren, Coman's Pond is even closer to Stir Bridge. Molly had actually sent a letter to the Burain and Biff family letting them know that she hoped Holly would return home safely. Um, but however, Holly's remains were found by hunters in the woods near where she was missing. So both girls were blonde and blue-eyed and were taken from isolated areas that were and they were also in close proximity of each other. Investigators looked into the possibility that the same person who murdered Holly was responsible for Molly's disappearance. As such, hunters from the local area were interviewed, with one saying he'd seen something suspicious months earlier, but at the same time he had thought nothing of it. So, going off the hunter's tip, police went into the woods, wooded area of Palmer, Massachusetts, and discovered a piece of cloth that appeared to be a part of a blue bathing suit, and Molly had been wearing a blue bathing suit. It was sent away to have DNS perform on it. Upon discovering the piece of cloth, a massive search was done in that same area of Palmer. Um, actually, it wasn't just Palmer. It was like 500 different areas, and it's said to be the largest search in Massachusetts history. Six days into it, DNA testing proved the suit belonged to Molly. So, on June 3rd, 2003, police began searching Whiskey Hill in Palmer, which is where the area um, her suit had been found, and discovered a human bone that belonged to someone aged 14 to 20. After more searching, a total of 26 more bones were recovered, and DNA tested, uh, DNA testing confirmed them to be Molly's. However, the search brought up no evidence that would point investigation investigators to her killer, just the location. So now they found her body. Now this uh, is leading into the actual investigation and goes more into suspects. So on August 2nd, 2003, three years after her murder, Molly was buried on what would have been her 20th birthday. After finding Molly, police believed their suspect what was to be a white male between the ages of 18 to 50, who was known to the area through either hunting or fishing. He was most likely, he most likely had a history of violence against women. So it's now February 
2008. And in order to bring new leads, the Bish family hired a PI, a private investigator. In February 2008, a man named Rodney Stanger was arrested in Marion County, Florida for the murder of his girlfriend. The reason why he had caught the attention of Massachusetts police is that someone had called the DA's office saying he was involved in Molly's murder based on a conversation with his girlfriend who was obviously now dead and murdered. During the time of Molly's disappearance and murder, Stanger, who shared a resemblance to the composite sketch that um, they had, that Maggie had seen, he, he had lived in the Warren area and was an avid fisherman and hunter who had fished at Coleman's Pond before. He was known to have a violent history and had moved from Southbridge, Massachusetts, Southbridge, Massachusetts to Summerfield, Florida about a year after Molly disappeared. His brother also owned a white Chrysler that looked similar to the vehicle Maggie had seen. Stanger was interviewed, Stanger or Stanger, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, was interviewed but denied any involvement in Molly's case. He would later plead guilty to his girlfriend's murder and is currently serving time in prison. A witness would later come forward to say that they had seen a man that matched Stanger's, Stanger's, Stanger's description in the Coleman's Pond parking lot just minutes before Molly and her mother arrived. A local worker also reported seeing a similar car parked at the cemetery that was down the path from the pond. So, pretty dang suspicious. Stanger was also questioned in connection with the 1993 murder of Holly Baranian. He has not been charged in relation to either case, but I'm pretty sure he's still in prison. Police began testing the DNA of persons of interest again, the DNA they uh, gathered in the case against some of the evidence. They also asked people to voluntarily submit their DNA for testing. The next Next suspect is Gerald Battistoni. In 2011, Gerald Battistoni was named a suspect in the case by another private investigator the Bishes have I had hired. At the time he was announced as a suspect, he was serving time for raping a teenager in the 90s, and he was initially a confidential informant for the Eastern Hampton County Narcotics Task Force. When police looked into his possible involvement, in not only Molly's case, but Holly's as well. They found he'd been in the area where Molly's remains were found and that he resembled the composite sketch. After being named a suspect in the two cases, he attempted suicide. Well, sus, I would say so. He would later die in prison in November 2014, which is almost as frustrating at compromising as compromising a price crime scene when they die in prison. In 2013, a new racetrack, a motorbike racetrack, was being dug in the area. So, sorry, I'll take it back. We are now in 2013. She was killed in 2000. It has been 13 years. Gerald Battistoni was in 2011, so they've had two years of nothing. Stanger was in 2008, so it's been five years, and now a racetrack is being dug in the area where Molly's remains were found. So invest investigators educated the construction crew on what to look for. They informed the crew on what Molly had been wearing, a blue suit and shorts, and what they might find um, when they find human remains, because not all her bones had been dug up, only 26. And from what I remember from high school biology, high school anatomy, um, there's about 200 bones in the body. Don't quote me. So cadaver dogs were brought in to see if any scents were released into the air during construction, but nothing was found. But then in 2014, a partially buried bag was found underneath a log in the woods near the Nemesek Sportsman Club in Palmer. Massachusetts by a PI. The area was across the road from where Molly's remains had been found, and inside the bag there were up there were black box 
boxer shorts that were similar to the ones Molly had been wearing the day she went missing. So, that boggled me because if it was literally right across the street from where her remains had been found, this was one of the most expensive searches for a person or for evidence in Massachusetts history. How did they not find the bag underneath a log right across the street? But, you know, things happen. They're building a whole motor sports arena. Like, I guess a log is going to get overturned and a bag is going to be found. Um, so they found those boxer shorts. So, um, after that, in 2014, a new person of interest was in the case. So, while some of this information was being withheld about the new person of interest, what had been shared, says the witness, recalled seeing a man visit an old campground in West Brookfield, Massachusetts, which was just a few miles from where Molly had been taken, and had left the same day she disappeared. According to the witnesses, he had returned the day after, and his face was bloody and scratched. He had been yelling about something bad happening in the woods the night before, and six months later, he was heard bragging about how he knew he was a person of interest in the case, but had never been interviewed. Whatever that means. The family hired a new PI who told them that authorities would be searching for the car Molly's killer could have been driving. She, um, the PI received a tip that the car was there was a car that was similar to the one Maggie had been seen that was being buried at a former campsite in the Brookfield, Massachusetts area. So um, the PI got a tip that there's a car being buried that looks like the one Maggie saw, which is a little sus, like why would you bury a car? Investigators used ground penetrating radar to search for the car and found compelling anomalies at multiple areas of interest that led them to search the campground a few days later. So that led the PI to believe that something was in the area. So now we're in 2017. Um, it's been 17 years. Volunteers went to the campground to search for the suspected car and while state troopers were present, but it wasn't considered an official part of the um, search effort having the state troopers there. So, according to Heather, the sister who does her own research and has our own private investigator, a man who physically resembles the composite sketch of the suspect still lives in the area. He's a hunter and a fisherman, and he had also had access to the campground through a friendship with the property's former owner. She also said that heavy construction equipment needed to bury a car was available in the campground around the time Molly went missing, but since then has been sold. So, investigators say that Molly's murder case is still open. So that was the last thing that happened was the car um, and it's still open. So now I'm going to be going into some theories and my opinions and a little bit about the suspects. So I was also reading on Reddit some of the different theories people had. So a lot of people think that Molly was lured into um, the woods or off her stand by someone who was faking an injury. Because if you're a lifeguard and someone is hurt, you go to your first aid kit and you get you give them a bandage. That's like just what you do. Maybe a fisherman or a man came up to her and was like, oh, I have a hook in my finger. Like, do you have tweezers? Do you have a band-aid? Um, I need help, little girl. And the little lifeguard's gonna go, that is my job. I am eight days into my job. I must do my job. I'm a lifeguard. I help people. That's what I want to want have done. Um, and then she goes and goes to the fisherman and gets this hook out and he snatches her up and leaves. He was, they also saw that white car, like, he was obviously casing. Um, so that's what some people believe. <laughs> um, other people believe so another theory states that Molly mistook her attacker for a police officer because a person um, of authority is really the only way to get a lifeguard off the stand. Like if my boss or my a police officer was like, 
like come here, blah 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 blah, I'd be like, okay, yes sir, because I am white and I trust police officers. Um, and so that leads me to talk about the suspect Bastonini, Gerald Bastonini. I, I'm, I can't find his name, I'm sorry, I have 10 pages of notes, but Gerald, the guy who is in prison and was on the narcotics um, prisoner task force team, he, I think he's a prime suspect because I was reading his background and he had three ex-wives who were terrified of him. They beat, like he beat them up, he raped, like everything you can imagine under the sun he did to these poor women and they were so scared to say no to him because he would threaten that they were he was going to kill them so you know a classic domestic abuse story but there was one wife who remembers him being gone the day molly was abducted um and she also said that he had a police uniform so i mean that is a really really weird coincidence he has a police uniform and it's possible that he could have lured Molly off the stand pretending to be a police officer. He also smoked. He also had a white car. Uh, he also looked exactly like the composite sketch that Maggie saw the mother, but he's dead.